So today's, today's topic is, I'm calling this Introduction to Pottery Kilns. I wanted to do a series talking about all the different kinds of kilns. We talked about wood firing kilns and, and incident and coal attached to that. And then we did a, a session on gas firing. And so this one's gonna be an electric kiln. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. Okay, so some advantages of electric kilns, just to sort of summarize some of what we've been talking about. Well, they don't need constant attention, so they're kind of the opposite of a wood kiln. You know, where a wood kiln, you're, you're stoking. My, my little wood kiln, I had this every five minutes I had to stoke. So it's kind of the opposite. You can, especially with a controller, you put them up and you walk away. Um, they have a lot of convenience features now. They have this delay feature on a lot of them where you can program it and then set a timer and you can have the, the, the firing actually start sometime later when you're not there. Because to me, kilns should, should fit my schedule, not the other way around. So I would, I, like when I run the kilns here, I program to end at a certain time when I know I'm going to be here. So I can, I, can, I can program in a delay. I can say, don't start, don't turn on the heat for another 12 hours so that knowing it's a 12 hour firing, whatever, it will end when I'm gonna be here Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. So that's a really nice convenient feature. I mean, it's simple, but it's convenient. A lot of them have a preheat feature where now I can do a long, slow hold and just pre, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm, if like for bisqueware or something, I, or if I have glazeware that isn't totally dry when I put it in the kiln, I can dry it out. And that's a nice convenient feature. And they even have things like an alarm now where I can, if I want to remind me of something, to do something at a certain temperature, I can set an alarm and have it just ring a buzzer and basically say, hey, it's, you know, it's, it's nine o'clock or it's this temperature. You, you, you wanted to remind to do something. The other thing that's nice about is with these custom schedules is I can not only, uh, not only I can save them, but therefore I can repeat them. If I go to, if I, if I'm, if I'm working out a, a custom schedule to do something special and I've got to do several attempts to sort of work out the details, when I finally get there, I can repeat it because I can program it in and I don't have to, I don't have to put it in every time saying, now what did I do last time to make this work out? It's built in. So I can, I can, I can write a custom program and then save it, which is a huge labor saving thing. Um, as I mentioned already, controlled cooling is easy now with these, with the program ones. I don't have to stand there and worry about it. And even now they've got, they, you can, for some of the newer controllers, I can, I can connect them to my computer and they even have Wi-Fi capabilities. So I can actually control your kiln from your phone if that's important to you. Okay, so just additional, some additional kiln equipment. Um, kiln furniture. We have actually, for unlike maybe for gas, for gas kilns or electric kilns, we probably have the widest choice of, of materials. And you have the typical, cordi what's, what's called cordiorite, the classic um, sort of these sort of yellowish beige um, shelf material. It's called cordiorite. That's actually the name of a mineral because the mineral actually exists. And you probably, everybody's seen these. This is sort of the classic, I'll pass it around, but this is sort of the classic kiln shelf material. And that's only good up to about cone 10. And even at cone six, after a while, it sags and droops and warps. Because when it gets hot, when it gets hot enough, it actually starts to melt a little bit, slightly. And so the, the, the shelves will, will sag a little bit. Um, they also have, they have shelves that have more aluminum oxide in them called high alumina shelves. The British, the, I don't know that Amer any manu American manufacturers make them, but in Europe they make them a lot. They're called high alumina shelves. And they're a little more warp resistant, a little more slump resistant than the cordierite. They're more expensive and they're heavier, physically heavier. Um, the other thing is now we have, and that, uh, one of, the, one of the, the things that actually works pretty well for uh, for electric kilns, these are called, this is called core light, C-O-R-E-L-I-T-E. -E. And this is, this is, they're still cordierite. But one of the things they're trying to do is, as you, if you've handled any of these, is take some of the weight out of them. You know, if you're loading an electric kiln and you're bending to put that bottom shelf in, that's a backbreaker. So that what they do is these are extruded. And so they have these channels in them so they can, you can have a thick, fairly stiff shelf. They've taken a lot of the weight out of it. These are only good for, uh, these, are, these are not even, these are not going to be so good at cone 10. Cone 6, they're fine. They're still going to warp after a while and slump, but they're a lot lighter weight. 
than, than the normal corduroy shelf. Because if I, like that's, that piece I passed around is fairly thin. If you had a corduroy shelf that thick, it's gonna be pretty heavy. So this takes a lot of the weight out of them. But they're still only, they, even at cone six after a while, they start to sag a little bit, and they, so they're no longer flat. One of the ways, and I'll, I'll mention it now because this is one of the things you can do about it, is if you have corduroy shelves, is when you bisque fire, flip the shelves over. Don't you always. Kiln sure, because you don't care if kiln wash falls on your bisque well, pots. So turn your shelves over, fire with the kiln, you know, you put the kiln wash on them to protect, so glaze the, put the kiln wash up when you're glazed firing, flip them over and put the kiln wash down when you're bisque firing, and you can extend, you can, you can cut down on the warping of the shelves. And then the last thing that, you, one of the things now you can get is, well, these are called advancer. This is silicon carbide shelves. And this, I'll, if you want to come up and look at one later, we use these here exclusively, but they're real, this is, this is the, you know, they're really lightweight, but this is the material. They're really strong, they stay flat, you don't need, you don't need kiln wash, and they're really expensive. This, is, this shelf here is $180. Mm -hmm. But if you, as long as you don't drop them on the floor, they're, they're, they're pretty indestructible. So I'll pass this around, but you can see they're a lot thinner, a lot lighter weight. You know, another advantage of them is they heat up a lot faster. One of the things, if I have a really thick kiln shelf, on this is this, and this 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 goes back to one of the things we were talking about, and we'll talk more about later, is loading. If I have some work, some really flat work, especially like people will make plates that don't have foot rings on them, you know, just a, like a flat plate. If it's sitting on the shelf, then the bottom of the plate is going to take a long time to heat up because it's sitting on a cold shelf. And the bottom of the plate that's sitting right flat on this shelf is not going to get hot until that shelf gets hot. So the rim of the plate that's sticking up is getting really hot very early, and the bottom of the plate is staying cold, which means that they're expanding differently, which means you can get cracking. So one of the advantages of these silicon carbide shelves is they heat up a lot faster, and you get a lot more uniform heating of pieces that are sitting on the shelves. So do the core light heat? Faster than a corduroy? They do, they, yeah, they're still corduroy, but, but right. they do heat faster because they're not as thick, because that thinner section can get hotter faster. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, but, so at least for, for electric kilns, we have a lot wider choice of materials that we can use for shelves than you do for gas or wood. Gas or wood, you can't use corduroy, you can't use, you can use high alumina, but you can't, you, and, and you really actually, you can't even use, you can't even use advancer. You can use a different kind of silicon carbide, but you have to use the thicker, sort of more old-fashioned kind of silicon carbide. Um, another sort of additional, I'm talking about additional equipment, is the kiln sitter. And I've got two examples I put. Is everybody familiar at all with a kiln sitter, vaguely or not at all, everybody? You know what a kiln sitter is? Okay. Um, I, I just, this is an example of a really early one, and that's an example of a, of a later one. The interesting thing is, if you notice, that one has a timer built on it, because in case the kiln sitter part doesn't work, the timer will help shut it off. And the real point why I brought these, yeah, this is the Vanna White thing. <laughs> The real point why I brought these in is these are not these were never intended to be a kiln controller. This is one of my pet peeves in ceramics. They were only meant to be a safety device because they're not that accurate. They're not re reproducible or reliable. So they were really only meant to, if you, if, if you were working in your studio and you had to run out and run an errand and you got run over by a bus and you, weren't, you couldn't get back to turn off your kiln, your house wouldn't burn down. They were never intended to, to really control the firing. You should always be firing by watching cones bend. So this is just a backup, which is why, and, and to me, it, it's, it's living proof. On the kiln sitter, it's got a backup to the kiln sitter because they know already, and they manufacture it, that it's, it's not going to work all the time, which is why they have the timer to back up the kiln sitter on the kiln sitter. Okay? So it's like, you know, it's pretty obvious they're saying, we don't have a lot of confidence in this product, but if you want to buy it, here it is. You know? <laughs> I, I'm going to tell a quick horror story that just happened. Well, it's oh, good. <laughs> but even on the digitals, because I've always heard you say, be there, be there, yeah, yeah. when it's going to cut off. Yeah. Well, of course, most of us going to get right. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, sure. <laughs> and I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I didn't, you know, I, or I might have been there, but I didn't have to check it or whatever. And I remember later that in the morning I checked and it said something, and I went, hmm, it must have cut off in the middle of the night because it said error and there was a storm, so it probably... Error P, off. probably. Right, and so I flipped the little button and went, okay, it's off, you know, and, and just walked out. Later that afternoon I went in and I was like, well, that temperature didn't drop a whole lot, you know, but I was in a hurry doing something and I went, 
It's just probably heavy load. I wasn't thinking about it. Was not back in the studio again because it was off. Next day, next morning, I go in. It's hotter than when I had gone in the afternoon before. And I went, oh crap. What the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, what, what is this? I, I had no idea. And so, of course, I'm pulling the plug at that point, you know, going, and I run into my husband who has a lot of electrical experience. I'm like, what, what the heck's happening here? And, and, he, and we had to do a lot of research because he's not that up on kilns per se. And it was the relay had gone. And it opens. It sticks. It stays open. Yeah. So that thing will be a continuous heat. And I lucked out, and it is in a block building too, but that thing is going to keep firing if, you're, if your relay fails. Yeah. So you could burn down. Yeah. So you, yeah. it, I did learn this. And <laughs> thankfully, nothing burned down, and actually, the kill mode turned down. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> but um, just to back up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I mean here. I make it a habit. Of, and actually, with any kiln, I'm always there when the kiln shuts off. I'm always there. And I don't care whether it's a gas kiln, a wood kiln, or an electric kiln. Um, I'm here. We just finished our 100th firing the kiln over there in the other building the other day. Um, but I'm always here when the kiln shuts For exactly that reason. Because I don't care whether it's manual or it's kiln sitter or, or electronic. Something can go wrong. Yeah. And yeah. I've fired it exactly <laughs> Zero. So I do set it so that I will be home when it's yeah, one yeah, off now. Yeah. And you should be looking through watching those little cones bend. Don't depend on the That's temperature. Next. I, was, <laughs> I, I, I grew up on that with the with the, the old paragon because yeah. that was the only way for me to control it. Yeah. But yeah. to wear the glasses too. Yeah. Okay, kiln vents. I just want to mention these briefly. This is additional equipment. There are really two kinds that I've seen. One is what I've been calling the downdraft, and that's where there's a fan either mounted on the bottom of the kiln, or the better models now, the fan is actually mounted on the wall. But, and you have holes drilled in the top of the kiln, and a couple of holes in the bottom, and it pulls air in through the kiln, and pulls the fumes out with it, and then gets them out of the kiln. I think the, the model where now they, it's an improvement, they've put the fan on the wall rather than under the kiln is better for a couple of reasons. One, the fan, doesn't, the fan motor doesn't get as hot. It's not sitting right under the kiln. But also, the hose that goes from the kiln to the hole in the wall is now being drawn on. So if that, hole develops, if that hose develops any pinhole, it draws in air. Whereas if the fan is under the kiln and it's blowing the fan, and if there are any holes in the thing, it's blowing it and the fumes are getting into the room. So it's actually safer to have the fan right on the wall so that the whole thing is being drawn suction and so that even if there are any leaks, it pulls the air in rather than blows it out into the room. But those are really effective. The other thing they've done is, is that the, the other thing that the old manual kilns had without, or the kilns without the fan had is the top was always hotter than the bottom because warm air, warm air does rise and um, heat doesn't rise, but warm air does. Um, but so the old kilns where they were kind of stagnant, the, the top was all, very often it was common to be a cone hotter than the bottom, at least. And they've pretty much eliminated that now. So just, and the thing is what these fans are doing is they're not creating a wind tunnel. It's just a very slight movement of air just so that the air isn't stagnant and it pulls the air out the bottom. Well, that's enough to even out the temperature. So you really don't have the problem of the hot top and the cold bottom anymore. It's pretty much eliminated that. Now the other kind of the other kind of fan I've seen is called is more what they call a fume hood. Like if here's your kiln, and there'll be this device that sort of sits over the kiln like that, and it's connected with a hose that goes off. And the idea is it collects the fumes. Those are worthless. Those are worthless because you'd have to have. <laughs> oh yeah, they all yeah, but the, and they're worth they're worthless because. If you think, if this, if this fan is on, why is that fan going to take air from down here when it can take air from here? So the answer is the air goes like this, and the fumes that are coming out here, and this, and go over here and hit the student. Okay? So the, these, the, these, are, these are pretty worthless. I mean, but they, they still sell them. And even the ones, they have some that lower down over the kiln. They, you'd have to have an incredibly strong, we used to use these a lot in industry where we had some kind of a piece of equipment and we could put it right next to the equipment and they're, they're better than nothing. But again, they're gonna take the, they're gonna draw the air the easiest they can. So they're gonna take air that's right next to it. If, if, if there's a leak in the bottom of the kiln and there are fumes coming out, 
why is this fume necessarily going to be drawn? There, you know, there isn't. You know, one thing you can, if you have one of these and you want to, this is an, there's sort of a paradox too, because when I've been in schools is that, and, I, and I've talked to teachers about problems like this is, on the one hand, they want to make it safer, but if they point out to the school administration that it's unsafe, they might just say, well, then let's just cancel the whole program. So it's kind of a catch-22 situation, but if you have the opportunity to, you know, to talk to somebody, one of the things that really works is a piece, is a, as a, um, a piece of incense stick. Take, get one of these incense sticks and light it, and you can use it to see where the air is moving. And turn on the fan and hold it down to the bottom of the kiln and see if the smoke from the incense fan goes up and is drawn into this, or see if it wanders off into the room. I almost guarantee it'll wander off into the room. But it's a nice way to demonstrate, in fact, what this fan is doing, or even how strong it is. You know, how far away can I go from this fan where it'll draw in the smoke from the incense stick? No, they're not. No. They're really not. And, they're, and, they're, and they work great. They really work great. And they do two things. The nice thing is they get the fumes out of the kiln, which extends the life of your kiln, and then they also get it out of the room. Because the, usually the hose, you go through a wall or through a window or somewhere, so it does the two things that you want to do at once with the one piece of equipment. Gets it out. This, this, this. The other thing is, see, this doesn't get it out of the kiln. This just gets it out of the room. So you still have the fumes finding their way out of the kiln and doing all the corrosion that they can on the kiln. So these are, these are, these are worthless. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for The Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, so all you need to do is get permission to put the hole in the wall. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a vent, but it's in a big, big, big barn. Mm -hmm. And I've been asking the people that work on the property not to be in there when I'm firing. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I would think that would still be... I mean, it's huge. I mean, it's probably ten times as big as this mm -hmm. room. Which you're probably fine. But, I, but they still probably shouldn't be in there when it's fire. Well, you know, this is the kind of thing where, unless you have some kind of... An, I mean, you know, like a lot of medical conditions are really kind of... I don't know, they're statistical. Like some people are very sensitive to something and other people are not. So there's no, there's no exact solution. But a lot of these things with these things like fume, it's, it's long-term exposure. So it's not like with most people, it's not like you know, one sniff and you're gonna fall over. Um, it's the kind of thing where after long-term exposure, you could have respiratory problems and things like that. So you're probably fine. If they were in there occasionally. Yeah, occasionally that's probably, you know, cause you're gonna, you're gonna notice it also. You'll notice that kind of acrid smell and it's not gonna be pleasant to be in there. Okay. Uh, I mean, I knew, there was a situation I knew years ago, there was a woman that had a kiln in her basement, and um, it was a little tiny basement with a concrete block basement, and she had her washing machine and her dryer in this one little part of the basement, um, and she, she also had a kiln in there, and she used to sit in there and watch the kiln fire while she was doing her laundry, and she'd been doing this for like 30 years. And I looked up, and I, I went over to help her check her kiln out one time, and I went over, and she had, like, you know the old high basement windows? And the basement windows weren't letting in a whole lot of light. And I, so I went over to look at the windows, and the windows were frosted. The glass had become frosted, basically, from the fumes in the, in the kiln. And she'd been sitting there for 30 years, you know, reading or something, watching the kiln and while her laundry was going on. Not good. Yeah. I mean, they, they, it had literally attacked the glass on it. Well, she was also using glazes that contained a lot of stuff that can produce. How is she? <laughs> I'm not sure she's still around even, actually. I'm not even sure she's still around. But yeah, but I thought you know, that was the worst possible. It was this little dead-end room with her in the kiln and her washer and dryer. It's like, eh, the worst possible thing. She's just sitting there breathing this stuff, you know. Plus, she smoked, which didn't help. <laughs> Just big and about that big. You know what works really well is a dryer vent. Yeah. You can hook it up to a dryer vent, but it's not any bigger than a dryer vent. So if you want to see one, go to the outside of this building on the back. Yeah, I can show you the one we have here. 
Yeah, but that's typically the, the thing that you can, you can use as a pass-through is, you know, the dryer vent thing, right. the little dryer hood? Right. That works great. So if you have two kilns, you need two of these on the wall fans? Well, no, because actually the, mo the model that we have here, at, say by Orton, the one fan is, is made to handle two kilns. And you're probably not ha firing the two kilns at once unless you own stock on the power company. So, you, you, so you, can, you, can, you can run both, you can permanently hook up both kilns to the single fan. Okay. Made by Orton. Okay. Orton Kiln Vent, it's called. Thank you. Okay, and the last little extra piece of equipment I, just, I mentioned already is maybe, or in, incidentally, is a pyrometer. You might want to, a pyrometer is just a thermometer for measuring high temperatures. And they can look, they can either be, they can either be analog, which just, they just have a little gauge on them like this that, um, it's, so basically it's a thermocouple hooked up to some kind of a thing. Or they can be digital, they can have a probe and you can read digital. But you might want to have, if you don't have a controller, you still might want to have one of those for manual kiln just to monitor the heating rate because without, with a controller, it's constantly telling you what the temperature is. But this way, if you don't have a controller, you can, you can monitor what's happening and you can see like, you know, gee, all of a sudden the kiln is heating up more slowly than normally. Instead of waiting till the end of the firing to find out that something went wrong, during the firing you could say, hey, something's going on with this firing. I know it's heating up more slowly than my other firings. So it's not, it's not a necessity, but it's a handy little, and they're not that expensive. It's a handy little piece of equipment to have. What is that again? A pyrometer. Oh, no, the thing that you held up. Oh, well, this is, this, is, this is a little pyrometer. There's the thermocouple. This is a really simple one. It's a little thermocouple, and I stick this through a hole in the kiln wall, and I read the temperature on the dial. This is an analog. And they make digital ones now that are more accurate and they're more responsive, but they still have the little thermocouple you stick in through the wall, only it has a digital readout. So do they make those so that uh, ceramic coating doesn't like break off eventually like they always do? Well, they have the most like the ones that I have now. That the one that I have that's digital, it's portable. This is all. This is a metal, a high temperature metal sheath mm -hmm. instead of being ceramic. Okay. This was this was ceramic partially also because if you drilled a hole, if you drilled a hole through the wall of the kiln, you got to make sure that you don't hit one of the elements when you're drilling the hole through. Can you put like in the peaking hole? Yeah, you could. Sure. That's the nice thing with the digital ones. You just have this metal probe, so you can just put it through one of the peepholes and check the temperature if you don't want it in there all the time. A lot of the times, though, you might want it sitting in there the whole during the whole firing, so you can monitor what's happening. If you poke it through, then you got to be careful you're not going to hit any pots. Mm -hmm. So you have to plan that when you're loading the kiln. Like, okay, I'm going to put the thermocouple in here, so I'll leave a little pathway where I'm going to put the, the, the thermocouple in. But sure, absolutely you could. Okay, and there, just to mention, there are two types of thermocouple. There's nothing simple, right? There are two types of thermocouple. One's called type K and the other is called type S. And type K is, is, um, is not as durable, basically, overall, it's not as durable as type S. They don't last as long um, and they're not as resistant to fumes and acids and things as the type S but they're a lot cheaper. So it's kind of analogous to the two kind of elements you have. You have a cheap one that, that works, but it's cheap and it's not as durable, and, but it costs a lot less. And generally, if you get a kiln, I'd recommend it's an option. They, they, they come with type K. If you have the option to get the type S, I'd say it's worth it to get the type S thermocouple. They'll last longer, and they're more resistant to corrosion and fumes and things like that. They might cost you an extra 100 bucks because they're made out of platinum, but they're pretty, they're pretty durable, pretty indestructible. Okay, advantages of electric kilns or electric firings, just to the, the, the procedure in general. Well, you have good precise temperature control now, much better than you do, for, let's say, generally with wood or gas. There's a wide range of kiln sizes available. Now, I mean, they have, now that you can get, and that you've had all along, but you have little small test kilns that run on just 110 volts. And now you can get bigger kilns, so there's, there are, there's, a, there's a much, and they're different, sh slightly different shapes, like you have the, you know, like square or oval. So you have a pretty good range of, of sizes. They're clean, they're convenient, they're easy to use. Um, not much maintenance is required on an electric kiln in, as routine. They're easy to repair. One of the reasons why I brought this other box, this is an older kiln where you just had the switches, but I, I brought this along just so people can look inside. And you can see there isn't much to them. If you have to replace one of the switches, they're it's a 10 minute job. They're really easy to repair. For you, it's a 10 minute job. <laughs> well, no but, no, but it's a few nuts and bolts. And, you know, I mean, they really are. You know, it's not like you. I'm in the middle of doing that right now, so. Okay. Like, so okay. But that's, I mean, they're, 
you know, they're not that complicated. Um, the other thing, I mean, they're, they're, they're portable. Now you can, almost all the electric kilns, they make, a lot of the bigger ones, they make in sections. That's the reason why, they, so you can move them around, so they're portable. You don't need a chimney, no chimney required. You don't need to preheat the kiln, the chimney, like with a wood kiln, especially a wood kiln, but get, uh, you need to preheat the, the, the chimney so you get some draw. Well, in this case, you're not worried about draw or gases. See, there's no need to preheat the bricks or preheat the kiln. You just turn it on. Um, and in fact, you can get a very rapid heat up if you want to. There's no stalling. With gas kilns and with wood, you probably all heard this feature where with gas kiln and wood kiln, you get up to a certain temperature and the kiln stalls because you're not putting in enough heat fast enough. Well, electricity, you just basically turn the knob up higher. And so you have almost unlimited, in some cases, too much heat. But, but there's no, it's not like there's any, so you don't, have the, you don't have the stalling issue that you have with gas and wood kilns. Um, controlled cooling is easy, as I mentioned. And you have consistent results. Very consistent results. Now, talk about disadvantages. One of the disadvantages of electric kilns is consistent results. And by that I mean it's the fact that electric kilns are so predictable is the fact that you don't have the opportunities for serendipity like you do with gas and wood kilns where happy accidents can happen and you can go, oh, look at that great flashing pattern I got or look at what happened when the ash hit the pot here. You have the reproducibility. They're incredibly reproducible, but you're not going to have the op as many opportunities unless you create them with a glaze or something, for something unusual, a happy accident. Happy accidents don't happen very often. Because you're not, you don't have those other, un, you know, unless you do. Well, I, I did say happy accidents now, you know. Not accidents, but happy accidents, okay. So, so there are a lot of people that claim that basically they, they love electric kilns, but they're too consistent. They like, they, like, they like a little of the unpredictability of some of the other kinds of firing methods. Um, electricity can be expensive depending on where you are. When I lived in Maine, electricity was really expensive because there weren't any, low, it was all brought in from Canada or from lower parts of New England, so it was pretty expensive. Um, another thing is that the insulating fire bricks in general cool down very quickly so that like gas kiln and wind kilns, because you build them out of the heavy bricks, they cool down really slowly and you get some really nice glaze effects. You tend to get more crystallization of the glazes and some nice color effects because the, the, the kiln is cooling down slowly and so are the glazes. That doesn't happen with electric kilns. They cool down you know, very quickly. You have a question? Yeah, can you put anything on the over top after you know, it's fired you know, so it would cool like slower? You'd have to wrap the whole thing in a blanket. And they're really not designed to do that because the insulation and the electronics and everything are made to take a certain temperature and they're, they're made to cool off to protect the kiln itself. So you really don't want to wrap the kiln in something. The best way to get around that is buy a kiln if you have the option with thicker bricks. Like some of them they'll have like three inch bricks is, is, is very often is an option. So if you want to do that, buy the kiln with thicker bricks if you want it to cool more slowly. Or program it to cool slowly. Or program it to cool down more slowly, right. But by themselves, when they turn off, they cool down slow. I mean, they cool down quickly. So you're not going to get some of these really nice crystallization effects that you get in gas kilns and wood kilns that are made out of the hard bricks, which cool down really slowly. Um, electronic controllers are sensitive to static electricity. You can you can zap your elect if you run across if you have, still have some nice shag rugs in your studio, and you run across them in your fur-lined slippers and go over and touch the electronic controller and go zap. You can actually zap your controller with, with static electricity. Um, when, uh, this is a question my husband. I, I said, do you have anything I should ask? And when he was reading a little bit on the relay, I've got an LNL, right? And he said, um, he thought the way he was reading this, they were saying not to vacuum because it can screw up the digital controller. Not to vacuum what? The, the kiln. Now, I didn't read it, nah. so I can't say specifically, nah. but nah. there's nothing there with the static or anything that would mess the digital or... Uh, well, you don't, want to, you, don't, you don't want to vacuum off the electronic controller. Okay. I mean, the, you know, that's yeah, I mean, you don't want to like open the box and, and vacuum out the inside. I wouldn't do that. Because, uh, yeah, you can generate static electricity with a vacuum cleaner, but we're just talking about vacuuming out the elements. Okay. And, that, and, if the, and if the relay is shut off, when you're vacuuming the elements, that's, a that's an open circuit. Yeah, when he was saying that to us, I was like, yeah. everybody's just a vacuum. 
Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. No, that's fine. That's fine. But and so, but the, the the part of the electronic controller system, as kind of you've alluded to, they're temperature sensitive, and they can even aside from maybe something going wrong. This is a, it, in, inside of here is this little sealed switch. They can also, you, if they get too cold, they stick. So it's not a good idea to have an electronic controller kiln sitting outside in a shed, because the the controller is sensitive to the element. The relays can stick. Well, when the temperature gets cold, and moisture, also high moisture can affect the controller. So an electronic, like the old fashioned kilns, you used to be able to keep them in a shed outside and as long as they didn't get rained on, you were fine. And that's still pretty true. I wouldn't put an electronic controller kiln outside that's really exposed to the weather. As long as it's, you know, kind of a little protected from the weather, I think you're okay. But I wouldn't put it out in just an outdoor shed that's totally exposed to moisture and high humidity and things like that, and especially cold. We know that this was a lot of information in a short period of time, so if you want to hear it again, listen to our podcast version of the presentation. Search for the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.